human babies are really expensive. Um, and I'm not just talking about what we have to pay the midwife or the doctor or the hospital or the birth center or even the $241,000 that it apparently costs to raise an American middle class child from birth to age 18 today or in more universal terms, Hilly Kaplan's figure of 13 million calories. I'm talking here about an expense that our species, our lineage has borne for hundreds of thousands of years if not millions of years and that is the expense of gestating being pregnant with a very rapidly growing, large-bodied, large-brained infant. Human infants are really big, and any of you who have given birth probably know what I'm talking about when I say that. Um, it's, uh, the, the data suggests that human infants, at, this is pretty late in pregnancy, are about twice the size of the infants of our closest living relatives. So human babies are about 6% the mother's si uh, of the mother's body size, and monkeys and apes tend to be about 3% on average of the mother's size. So you can just see from that graphic to me that made those figures jump out because it looks like a really big thing. And again, those of you who have been pregnant know what that feels like. Um, for the first six months of pregnancy, the first two tri trimesters, the main thing that's happening is the baby's being made. So the little, the, the, the actual organs are being developed. Um, by the end of the six months, most of the work of making a baby has occurred, but now it's time, and beginning with the last trimester, um, to put on weight, to put on fat, to eat as much as you can to, put, to give that baby um, an inordinate amount of fat. In fact, if any of you have looked at baby animals, baby monkeys, baby, baby chimpanzees, and compared them to baby humans, you know that there's a huge difference in just what their little faces look like um, with fat, chubby cheeks, and so on in the human baby. So that last trimester, that's what the green is referring to there, um, all the, almost all the uh, energy that the mother's able to consume goes toward putting down fat. And that gives the baby a head start in the first several months of life. The fat also helps the mother um, with her uh, uh, lactation, with uh, developing the breast milk, and so on. But it's a very important uh, time period. So how does a mother get, um, get the fat that she needs? Um, she needs, a, in the last trimester of pregnancy, she needs somewhere between 300 and 500 calories um, in order, beyond what her body needs, beyond the kind of work that she's doing to, just to give to her baby. Um, and for most of us, that's a really easy thing to do. In fact, some of you may actually put on 500 calories just during the break today. Um, <laughs> But for our ancestors, this was not such an easy thing to do. Um, on the right-hand side are the ones that we eat pretty frequently and get our 500 calories. On the left are some of the foods that our ancestors were eating. And you, most of these are very difficult to obtain. And so any kind of help that the mother can get during pregnancy to help her put down those extra calories. So anybody who can share food with her, uh, members of her social group, her relatives, her partners, um, her, aunt, her, uh, her friends and so on is going to make a difference in her being able to put down that extra uh, fat. She has a couple of things that she can do. She can just eat, 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 eat. Um, and I think this little squirrel kind of illustrates the idea of stuffing your face. And just put on as many calories as possible. But any of us who've stood before a Thanksgiving table, uh, Thanksgiving table laden with wonderful foods knows that you reach a point where you just can't eat anymore. No matter how good it looks, no matter how wonderful it is, you can't eat anymore. And that's what happens to all of us, whether we're pregnant or not. We just reach a point that even if our friends and relatives are bringing tons of food for us, we just can't eat, uh, but we can only eat so much. The other thing that they can do, though, is help us out. Um, for a pregnant woman, she's expending a, a fair number of calories just to keep her body alive. She has to expend the calories for gestating her baby, but she also needs the calories in order to go out and get the food, to gather the resources that she needs to stay alive. And as you can see, with this mother, she's carrying a baby, a, a toddler. It's probably about two or three years of age. She's carrying a, a lot on her back. She's working quite a lot. So if her friends can help her reduce her labor so that she can give more of the calories that she's able to consume to the baby that she's gestating, then there is an advantage to that. So she's not going to sit back on the couch and eat bonbons and watch TV, but if they can just reduce that, uh, the amount of, of, of her uh, calories that are going to her baby, then that improves the circumstances for her, uh, for her infant. Um, it's also important to get, this, the, I mentioned that the baby's brain is growing quite rapidly at this point too, 
And in order to get good omega-3 fatty acids and things that are particularly good for the brain, um, some of the hard-to-get foods, particularly animal protein, um, that could be provided by uh, her friends and her kin. So this is what I call the first point in the child-rearing cycle. Providing some help in the last trimester. This is when the mom is, it's pretty obvious that she's pregnant at this point, so anybody who can help relieve her burden, provide her with uh, omega-3 fatty acids and so on, um, there will be an advantage there. So again, the first point of shared child-rearing. But eventually, no matter how much she's eating, she reaches a point where that fast-growing baby with that fast-growing growing brain uh, essentially outstrips her ability, her metabolic ability to provide those nutrients. And this is what Peter Ellison and others have referred to as the metabolic crossover point. This is the point, the, the graph I'm trying to show here, the sort of orangish line is uh, the, the rapidly growing fetus and the, and the nutrient needs that it has, energy needs that it has, and then the mother's ability. She, her ability to metabolize gets a little bit better in pregnancy, but it certainly reaches a limit. And according to Ellison's view of things, it, this is the point where the baby, in his words, begins to starve. The fetus begins to starve. And this is it's some, some, some aspect at this crossover point. Uh, some trigger actually begins parturition, begins the birth process. It's a good thing that the baby comes out when it does after about nine months of pregnancy because um, if it doesn't come out soon, it's going to run up against the very rigid pelvis that we have. And again, those of you who've given birth or watched someone give birth, you know that it is not an easy process. It is a very tight squeeze. What we have are these large infants with large brains. Um, most births occur head first. Um, and it is a tight squeeze. And then one further complication that we have beyond that of most other uh, primates that also have a tight squeeze at birth is that our pelvis is adapted to bipedalism, which means that it is twisted in the middle. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, but for most primates, because we are large-brained animals, for most primates, it is a tight squeeze. This is a schematic um, that goes back to uh, Adolf Schultz's work in the 1920s that shows the relative size, the dark circles of the baby's head, the neonate's head, in comparison uh, with the mother's um, pelvis. And you can see um, really tight squeezes in everything except the chimpanzee. The chimpanzee's mother is pretty large. Uh, her body's pretty large. Birth is actually pretty easy. The labor contractions are probably just as challenging as they are for us, um, but the squeeze is not as tight, so it's usually a relatively uh, simple process. Um, but it's a tight squeeze for most of the other primates. So um, many primates are, and, and, other, and some other animals as well, are at the maximum that their uh, heads can get through, um, through the pelvis. But as I mentioned a minute ago, because of bipedalism, our pelvis is twisted in the middle. And I've tried to show this. This is a baboon uh, uh, pelvis on the left. Um, and a human pelvis on the right. And you can see that the, if we can divide the pelvis into a pe the in inlet of the birth canal and the exit of the birth canal, you can see that those are, are uh, uh, going in the same plane for the baboon, and you can see that they are perpendicular to each other in the human. So it's, it's twisted in the middle, and uh, this twist requires uh, a number of, of compromises as the human is, is being delivered. In a, a macaque birth, um, and this is probably true for most primates, um, the baby enters the birth canal facing toward the front of its mother's body, and it exits in that same plane without undergoing rotation. And you can see with the little yellow arrow there, you can see the baby's coming out facing in the same direction that the mother is. It has the motor ability to actually help guide itself out of the birth canal, but she reaches back to do so because she's giving birth up on a, a, a tree limb there, and if she didn't help the baby out, there'd be some problems with that. She brings the baby up to her breast and begins nursing. With the human, what we have is we have all these dimensions that are not going to give too much. We've got the pelvic inlet, uh, the birth canal inlet, which is widest side to side, the pelvic midplane right there. That, at that station, the ischial spines, um, is, it, that's the narrowest point of the birth canal, and that's the point where the baby, which is entered facing side to side, you can see that that is not going to pass through going in that direction. It has to undergo rotation to be able to emerge through the pelvic outlet, which is widest front to back. Now the baby's head has to line up. All these dimensions need to line up pretty well. Um, and the shoulders, if you can just think about our anatomy, the front to back dimension of the head is the greatest dimension, but the shoulders are perpendicular. So we've got all kinds of fun things we have to do in order to get um, born um, unless we're going to do a cesarean section. So this is what happens with a human birth. Um, you have a series of rotations. Uh, those of you who are familiar with this um, this, this drawing may appreciate the fact that we had the mom standing, uh, sitting up 
in this rather than lying flat on her back, as you often see in obstetric texts. Um, but anyway, the baby enters facing side to side, undergoes rotation, and comes out facing backwards, facing away from the mother. If she's lying flat on her back, it's facing down. But again, I prefer to think of it as an anthropologist facing backwards because I would prefer to think of the mother in the upright position, which is much more common across cultures. Um, this provides some challenges to the mother at this point. Um, this is a Japanese macaque giving birth uh, to a baby that's facing in the typical direction of the human delivery. This is kind of unusual for Japanese macaque because most of them do come out facing forwards, but in this example, she was facing, the baby was facing backwards. And I think you can see from that how, how, how challenging it would be for a bipedal animal to reach back and help to guide the baby. It's not impossible. Women give birth alone all the time. Um, but it's a little bit more challenging, challenging, and I would argue that mortality re was reduced in our ancestors when she began to seek some form of assistance at birth. Um, so here are some things that having someone present at delivery can do. We're not talking about high-tech obstetrics or even highly skilled midwives. We're just talking about having someone, uh, your mother if you're the one giving birth, your sister, your co-wife, your friend, whatever, or your, your partner, your, uh, the father of the baby. They can help to guide the baby out of the birth canal and keep it from falling to the ground. Uh, most babies are born with a lot of fluids around their faces, around their mouths and noses, and if she's in a position to be able to wipe that clean so the baby can start breathing or so that when it does start breathing, it doesn't suck down those uh, fluids. Um, also, it can check for the umbilical cord being wrapped around the neck. Um, in a high percentage of births, the, uh, the, the, baby, the umbilical cord is wrapped around the neck, and it's very simple to go in and, and lift it over and help the uh, baby uh, complete. And perhaps more importantly, uh, perhaps the most important thing in terms of our evolutionary history, um, it's difficult because the baby is highly undeveloped at birth. The baby doesn't have the motor skills to be able to climb up its mother's body to get to the breast. Granted, we're not, we don't have the hair for it to uh, hold on to, um, but even then, it's very difficult um, for a baby to, grow, uh, to go up and, and begin nursing. What has to happen very soon after the delivery is that the um, breast needs to be contacted, preferably by the infants uh, just nuzzling the breast. And at this point, that shoots, a, shoots oxytocin through the mother's system, which leads to the clamp down. Uh, well, first leads to the, uh, the birth of the, of the uh, placenta, and then the second, time, the second contraction usually leads to the clamp down of the uterus. Um, postpartum hemorrhage occurs in about 10% of births in the world today, and it, it is the, uh, the, the uh, factor that accounts for 35% of maternal mortality at birth. So postpartum hemorrhage has probably always been a problem, partly due to the very, very deep um, association between the placenta and the, uh, and the uterus uh, in the mother's body. Um, and so anything that would help uh, keep the mother from suffering from postpartum hem hemorrhage, when, which when it, if it doesn't kill her, uh, will certainly cause some problems with uh, losing blood and things like that. So these are the kinds of things that um, a, a midwife, a birth attendant can do without being terribly, terribly skilled in this. So this is what I call the second point of shared child rearing. Um, this is friends and kin who are present at the delivery to help care for the mother and the baby. There is some evidence, and I'll have to talk to Sue Carter about some of this, but there's evidence that um, fathers, when they're holding their baby, um, experience an elevation of oxytocin, which is, uh, Sue and others have referred to as the love hormone. Um, but I'm, I don't know if this has ever been tested, but I'm willing to bet that uh, family members and friends who are present at the delivery who have some affection or some emotional attachment to the mother and the baby also experience that oxytocin. And if oxytocin leads you to then have more affection, more bonding, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. I know the bonding literature is controversial to some, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that those who are present at a birth, who otherwise have an attachment with the mother and the infant, are, feel more bonded with the baby and are more likely to uh, provide care and so on. So this might be one of the chemicals that we have um, that helps us in this caretaking process. Um, the other thing, of course, as I mentioned, is that the baby's brain is quite, uh, even though it's large, it's relatively small at birth compared to what it will be as an adult. Um, this is due to the metabolic limits having been exceeded um, at about nine months of gestation when the baby has only developed about 30% of, its, uh, of its, what it will have as an, uh, an adult cranial capacity. So its ability to actually do anything to help itself get born is really quite limited. Um, and a lot of that then its, it's uh, survival is dependent on its parents. There are some good things about this though. Um, we are language animals, so 
the ability to be exposed to the outside world while the uh, brain is growing in that first nine months of life um, would be uh, definitely selectively advantageous. Um, what you're looking at here, this is the first year of life. This is birth and the sensory hearing and, and um, vision develop in that first month, year of life and a lot of language is developed during that first year of life. The baby's not necessarily speaking, but lots of language, we know that from lots and lots of research. A um, lot of uh, language learning is taking place in that time period. So there's an advantage, not just a bunch of disadvantages with a metabolic limits and a tight pelvis, but there's an advantage to being born before the brain is completed growing so that um, that language learning can take place during that time period. So in conclusion, we give birth to very, very expensive and highly dependent infants. Um, there's a first stage, what I call the first stage of child rearing, um, which uh, is when uh, friends and kin and, and members of the social group help to provide food for the mother, particularly during the last trimester of pregnancy. Um, and then there's a benefit gained from having friends and kin present at the delivery to help you get through that uh, period and perhaps to be exposed to the infant so that um, you're content gonna continue uh, doing that um, investment in the infant. Um, one question we might ask is, well, is the baby really, in t really totally helpless to help himself at birth? Um, just look at those pictures. They aren't at all helpless. They are very, very cute um, with really chubby cheeks and looking alive and maybe not quite smiling yet, but at least uh, looking pretty cute to, to the mom and the dad and some of the other family members. Um, they, and, and maybe with a little goose of oxytocin from the people who are observing the, the delivery, um, they make us fall in love with them and then they're, we're willing to invest time and resources and sometimes even our own lives in, in raising them from birth until independence. Thank you. <laughs>